and it's uh, it, it's a notion from finance uh, and from risk management strategies, and it describes uh, the portfolio of different risks that you can predict uh, for an institution, for a place for a um, uh, for an organization uh, taking into consideration different aspects from climate to finance to uh, social unrest or wars or pollution and uh, currently so the risk management strategies are among many uh, many industries that are monetizing the future uh, the predictions of the future and um, this exhibition is about uh, this idea how today uh, there are many industries that are capitalizing on uh, on the future already today and um, how we can actually look at the future from the point of view of uh, other non-Western points of view. Uh, and, uh, you know, how uh, no matter whether the predictions about the future come true or not, uh, they can already be monetized and they become this kind of product that becomes uh, sold today. And I was really inspired by Mundam as a building, by this architecture and especially this glass corridor, which is really so incredibly beautiful. And uh, as I was thinking a lot about technologies that are capitalizing on the future, I thought about how uh, other cultures um, have different notions of the future embedded in the language. So I did a really broad research into how uh, other non-Western languages are understanding uh, spatially uh, where the future is located. So for Western cultures, the future is ahead of us, in front of us, but actually for uh, many other cultures and many languages, and so far I identified 15 languages like that, uh, for them, um, future is not located in front of us. The future is behind us, above us, or below us. So I... Uh, uh, created this piece, thinking about you know how we are sort of suspended uh, in in space and looking outside of the museum or the outside world. This is this kind of like you know being being uh, suspended in, in in the world outside of the museum. And so I uh, uh, used translations of the word future into these fifteen languages that imagine the future somewhere else, not in front of us. It's a phenomenon that appears in various complex systems, for example, in uh, colonies of bacteria or colonies of termites, but also in the human brain, that uh, out of millions of elements, millions of molecules, millions of animals or bacteria or cells or citizens, new, new unpredictable forms emerge. And I got interested in this phenomena because we live in the uh, world where uh, we are constantly being told that everything is predictable and computable, especially with algorithms. And so I thought it was interesting to, to, to uh, dive in, in this realm. And I've been uh, making works about collective intelligence or working with collective intelligence for over 10 years. And so, uh, for example, this piece is uh, uh, named Chemical garden and uh, the forms that you can see inside of this aquarium um, uh, I make it each time for each institution a new so this this garden was made uh, just a few days ago uh, what you see inside are uh, metals there are sorts of metals which are used in computers and mobile phones and monitors um, so uh, these, me these metals such as uh, iron, copper, nickel, chromium, uh, cobalt, uh, the salts of these metals, they were present uh, millions and millions of years ago before life started uh, at the beginning, uh, yeah, at the bottom of the ocean. And these salts were mixing together in hot temperatures and they produced forms that already looked like life. But this was before the most primitive forms of life emerge. So uh, these forms and this phenomenon of chemical garden was, is currently being studied by NASA uh, scientists to think about if uh, life is possible in other places in the universe, but not based on carbon.
because uh, it's basically uh, when you look at these forms, you will see they look very much like living organisms or plants. So uh, each time, you know, I'm recreating the, in this kind of quasi alchemical process, uh, new forms that grow and they decay over the course of several months. And uh, but when some elements decay, some branches fall because of vibrations in the, uh, you know, in the soil or like really micro micro factors that are not there's a uh, they are not perceptible to us, but they have an impact on these tiny branches. But when some of the branches break, something else grows up. Uh, and each colony is at least uh, one million specimen. And uh, each uh, termite mound is different. And entomologists are able to say what something interesting about the colony and its collective personality by looking at the shape of the mounds. Zinc inside, and the zinc goes into the crevices and, and corridors and fills them in. And then we, after some time, we take out this negative cast that is a portrait of these uh, inner systems and uh, what is, you know, how each of these colonies becomes collectively intelligent in a different way. The fragments that you see, the colorful facets, are um, uh, fragments of a material, of a new geological formation that was. Um, identified uh, uh, and found by workers uh, from uh, factories that closed uh, in Detroit and in other cities. And uh, workers became unemployed, workers of these car factories, and they discovered that after 100 years of car production, when cars were being painted on production lines, the paint was floating in the air, it was falling off the ground, and layer after layer, it was accumulating, uh, congealing, and fossilizing. So it produced a quasi-geological material that the workers themselves uh, called Fordite to uh, commemorate Henry Ford, who created the first uh, car companies, the Ford Motor Car Company. So I started buying fragments of this material of Fordite from the workers because this material is now circulating online, accruing value, and it's used to produce jewelry. You can buy it even at uh, auctions of precious stones. So I buy rough fragments of this Fordite and we publish it. And each of these facets is from a different factory around the globe. So some come from Detroit, but some come also from uh, Italy or Poland, or Bangladesh, wherever there were uh, now closed uh, car factories. And what was interesting about this uh, fossil, about this quasi-geological formation, is that it is actually rare because there is a finite finished amount of these fragments because this factory is now closed and car production now is fully automated. Factories are very clean, very clean so no more of this material will be uh, produced. There's no more byproduct of this, of contemporary car production. Mm, what was interesting for me is that we can see different strata of the, how the fashion uh, for different colors of cars has changed. So you see yellow or red from the 60s or metallic colors in the 80s, and it's all kind of written in this strata. But it's also, of course, like an accumulated labor of all the workers that worked on these um, on these production lines over well 100 years uh, with different uh, technologies from drones to artificial intelligence to chips that are put under the skin of animals and there is this basically a collective global gathering of information about various you know life forms so I uh, together again with um, computer scientists we aggregated uh, in uh, all this um, information from many scientific institutes that uh, follow Follow different animals, and it's all—all all this information is aggregated, and it's powering this one uh, cybernetic organism that is uh, evolving. The organism is made with ferrofluid. It's a substance that was invented. Um, for the NASA in 1963, but it has never really found an application, uh, like an industrial application, but it's a form of matter that is capable of transforming. And so it's con in this case, I'm controlling it in an electromagnetic field and uh, the data from all these or living organisms from uh, around the globe is animating the movements and the kind of collective behavior of this. And uh, this series of works is related to the new industries of uh, that uh, were created in the um, 20th, uh, 21st century. One is the 
um, uh, market, the real estate market of air rights, which is the empty space above buildings. So, you know, when you have a skyscraper and there's a um, uh, space above it, now this empty space can also be sold as a product. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, there is new markets of minerals uh, where, uh, you know, scientists and economists are preparing for mining of asteroids and comets. And this mining is still not possible, but the speculation about it and people putting money into it has already started. So I was interested in this like whole speculation about the industry that is not there because the technology is not there yet. We know how to mine the asteroids. We don't know how to bring it to planet Earth. And so this kind of virtual, you know, like it's already like selling of futures, of future industries. So anyway, they are in um, levitating uh, meteorites. Uh, titled air rights and you know it's an electromagnetic field created between the sculpture and the pedestal and so they are always covering at this you know but very sort of fragile so any you know any touch or even movement of air can cause it to drop so it's a it's very kind of you know unstable and like a fragile stability.